international hybrid team. And we'll tell you more about that happening in and around Ukraine with Ukrainians and others. Here on transitional justice, which is a function of Project Expedite Justice, which is uh, headquartered in Kona, Hawaii, but operates around the world in various continents. And one of its people is with us today, uh, and she is uh, in Cyprus, Greece. Well, Cyprus is not in Greece, but it's near Greece, right? Uh, Cyprus, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Island. okay. And uh, she is uh, Elisa Goloshapova. Uh, I think I got that right, mostly. Um, and uh, she is a member of Project Expedite Justice, uh, and she is going to talk to us about hybrid teams. But first, Elisa, you know, what have you studied? What qualified you to get into Project Expedite Justice? Uh, how did that happen? What is your strong suit that makes you a worthy candidate? Well, I have quite wide experience and pro um, project coordinations and managing projects in different types so for the uh, business and uh, also the social uh, civil society projects. Uh, and I've been um, working as an um, executive director for the uh, nonprofit for for six years in Ukraine, so I'm quite familiar with the field. Uh, not, not even one time uh, about the uh, any any type of legal project. Um, so yeah, and I started international relations. How did you uh, How did you settle on Cyprus? Uh, why Cyprus? What is happening in Cyprus that we should know about? Uh, well, uh, well, I would start that I relocated here, and I was studying here um, 15 years ago, and I have uh, friends um, and some you know, uh, friendly environment here. Um, so it was um, it's just it was a decision to relocate uh, because of uh, what happening in Ukraine, because I'm I'm from Kiev and uh, I have a key, so we had to move. Uh, since the war started and uh yeah it was just um we were invited by our friends to come and uh and so we relocated but and what it, what is uh what is very difficult here is uh that um it's also occupied territory uh you know the the, the part of cyprus is occupied and uh, they've been through um this um, many years ago that that kids are still living in Cyprus. They're not kids anymore, but they do remember this um, horrible, horrible uh, terror, yes, and occupation. And uh, though the things are a bit slow down, uh, and you know, but it's 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 triggering them. Ukrainian situation is triggering them a lot. Well, let's let's talk about. Uh, I was telling you before. There's a very interesting uh, documentary movie, essentially about two sisters who left Syria and got across the Greek Sea uh, into Lesbos and then ultimately into Germany. Um, they were qualified swimmers, and one of them got into the Olympics in Rio. So this is the story of um, these two women, and um, what it teaches us is is about the the journey, if you will, uh, from the Middle East. Um, and for that matter, I suppose it'd be similar from Ukraine, to find a place in Europe. The Europeans, uh, some of those countries, some of those people have very kind hearts, and they will help. Uh, others, not so much. And I wonder, you know, what the experience is like for you to be away from your home um, and to be um, in another place in Europe and to be um, subject to a, another culture where not everybody may like to have you there. And um, I wonder what your experience is with other Ukrainians who have made the same trip. I'm sure you know a lot of them. <clears throat> and are they going to go back? How committed are they to going back? And if they find a decent life in, in places west of Ukraine, will they, will they ultimately prefer to stay there? Yeah, thank you. Well, um... So many things, <laughs> um, but um, we definitely want to come back. Uh, we are dreaming uh, to go back, and uh, mostly, uh, 
I don't know the people I met. I've met. Uh, they are just waiting and for for, for kids or for some security reasons they're staying in the moment abroad. Uh, but we are just counting the days, you know. Um, of course, there will be there will be a part uh, of those who who left that will not go back or will not go back uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, but I, I believe eventually they will go back. Uh, we are very grateful for for this support from. Uh, in Europe, from all the countries that are hosting our people, that are helping. Uh, yeah, mostly it's uh, mothers and kids. Yeah, and uh, I think it's been nine months of uh, it's been changing. Yeah, uh, the situation. First, you run and you think that um, you have to stay and help, you have to be able to help your people to support the army to volunteer to do whatever we can on the ground because they they need we need everyone needs um you know everyone's support and that's how I, that's actually how ukrainians united before this time uh, but then you also realize that you have to protect your kids and uh, yeah, you have to for the sake of for the sake of future let's say <laughs> for, for for your family um you have to go and then uh, it's very uh it was a, a key um, moment for me when i started to cooperate with uh project Exodus justice you know to feel that um feel that accomplishment that might be happened that might be done and uh you start to feel that uh okay here is my part and that's what i can do my country that's that's where i will contribute right and now uh, this is this is what makes it uh, successful when, you, when we are talking about that yeah. <laughs> so uh, tell me about the uh, the teams you know the hybrid teams i find it interesting because uh, it's it's something relatively new it reflects uh, a certain organizational mission of some kind um, and I remember hearing more than once that the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian society is good at organization. It's good at organizing itself. Um, that you put a bunch of, you know, Ukrainian soldiers together and they will figure out how to get organized. Um, you're part of that. What What is the hybrid team organized to do? What is it like? Describe it to us. Yes, yeah, so the, the, I think the key point, uh, of the um, of the project was to uh, unite uh, the um, whole type of people and first of all to unite Ukrainian lawyers and international lawyers and uh, it's really talented big, uh, team um, that unites you know uh, the expertise dedication and um, and the years and years of experience in different uh, international um, legal um, spheres, like investigation and, uh, and just lawyers and uh, prosecutors. So um, those different types of experience and uh, culture backgrounds uh, bring the, uh, this hybrid view on the things and on the project and you know, how we all contribute. But also having Ukrainians uh, among that team, uh, it's very important because it's all about understanding of the background, right? And it's about um, making partnerships on the ground. And uh, we have people from Ukraine, me and my colleagues, that they have um, a great network on the ground and they are also experts in what they're doing and they're trusted so it makes it this process of building up the relationship with local organizations more smooth and this is very important because ukrainians you know they will um 
they will not believe you just like that straight away like uh, even if you come with the open mind and heart uh, so they will still uh, be, have a little hesitations you know because uh, yeah because we had different situations we had different experiences um especially with international organizations and even even with the CIA in this war let's see what now, can we happened? talk about trust for a minute? You know, so, so you want to you want to talk to somebody, you want to, you know, get get some data, some information from somebody, you want to build a case, whatnot. Um, but you have this barrier uh, where they may not trust you. Um, but you're Ukrainian, and uh, the people who are going to talk to them are Ukrainian and and understand presumably. But but somewhere along the line, the trust has been undermined. Uh, what undermined it? What uh, do people in Ukraine worry about in terms of trusting the investigator? Well, uh, we have to start here from the point that, you know, I think the uh, uh, trust to the even local authorities, like police, uh, it started slightly to change since the revolution of dignity. Yeah, since so they're reforming the, this authority uh, when they brought this uh, really nice looking young uh, cops trained. Yeah, and so we felt like, okay, now we know the situation is going to change. Uh, and slightly it is it really changed. But even though um, the last um, polls they show that people are not addressing their uh you know they they do not report the crimes even war crimes to the police first of all because this is something never happened to us right and uh we don't know that uh the you know the the, the uh, those who are who committed the crimes uh they will be you know they will have accountability for them so there is no um strong belief that um, the accountability will be there for, for those those crimes. Is that a legitimate belief? Yeah, no. I mean, uh, what I mean is that they they suspect that this may all be for nothing. Um, that at the end of the day, there will not be accountability. You know, I'm remembering Holodomor. Do you remember that term, Holodomor? Back in 1933, courtesy Mr. Stalin, uh, how he wrecked Ukraine by starving people. And then replacing his uh, acolytes of uh, Russian settlers and attempting to turn the whole country into another Russia. Um, a lot of people died, at least five million people died in that time. And I wonder if the, you know, that historical experience has some connection with what you were talking about. That is, be careful about trusting people. Well, the whole, the, I, think, I think the whole USSR experience is, is that example. Uh, and also, I believe that historically we had more, more, uh, more examples of uh, international relations uh, that are, um, you know, that where we were as a country we were betrayed, where we were played uh, by others. So this brings it all uh, distrust uh, in a way, uh, if I may say. So yeah, um, probably. Uh, but, but the important thing is that um, you still have to try. Yeah? You still have to try to explain. And uh, you have to be there, even though if uh, today they are not sharing with you, you have to show your presence and uh, you have to prove somehow that okay, these are the steps we are taking and uh, this is what we are doing and we still will be doing that. And when you feel like you will, Welcome. Yeah, I think that's very important and profound. So, you know, uh, I was telling you there were two stories that I noticed in the New York Times today. Um, one of them dealt with uh, the uh, efforts of the Ukraine army have, have expanded beyond the border, beyond the Russian border, and they are sending uh, drones into Russia, in long distances into Russia. And, de and destroying targets inside of Russia, apparently on a regular basis, uh, starting just a, a few days ago. 
and and that and that would enhance morale. If I was Ukrainian, and P.S. My family is Ukrainian. If I was Ukrainian, I would be happy uh, <laughs> to see them do that. On the other hand, there's another story in, about Kyrgyzstan. Uh, Kyrgyzstan is, is is a kind of wrecked city. And there's nothing much left, but there are some Ukrainians who did stay or go back, and they are there, and they, they are worried about every everything, about the Russians coming back mostly, um, and about not, you know, getting enough, um, what do you want to call it, help or money or infrastructure to rebuild the city. By the way, I also saw an article about how Israel is, is finally helping, that Israel engineers are working on what you need to do to rebuild, which is a very important issue. But but what I'm getting at, uh, Elisa, is that morale has to be a big part of this formula that you're talking about. Morale has to go with trust. You want people to feel like ultimately there's a reason for all of this and that they can rebuild their country. So when they see you know the army firing drones into Russia, that's good. When they see people worried in Kyrgyzstan, that's not so good. When they see the Israeli engineers looking around and, and trying to figure out how to rebuild the country, that's great. But the question is, it's dynamic, it changes. And so as the morale of people in the Ukraine changes because of these various events, good and bad, um, so must their willingness to work with you Right. If they're optimistic, if they want to see justice done, they will work with you. If they're pessimistic, maybe not. Do you observe that? Do you know about that? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I can. Uh, and I will can can say that the uh, the trend is positive. Right. Uh, when as, as we started to talk about uh, international justice, as we started to talk about tribunal. As more and more news coming uh, that the European partners as well, they're going to support uh, those to be taken to into accountability. Yeah, so people started to believe, and we are uh, optimistic. Yeah, uh, nation. Uh, that's what uh, gives us a hope. That what gives us the power to to resist and uh, to balance ourselves because. Uh, you have to you have to be at this point where you you still let have to let yourself to suffer a bit to have that emotions but then you don't have to focus on that because this is not it leads you nowhere you have to focus on the positive thing so so these small um uh, you know victories and bigger victories and eventually one big big victory will be there i mean uh, it gives hope uh, and it gives power and it gives us that uh, energy to work, to continue to support um, uh, to support local people, to, to continue work for making change. And, uh, you know, yesterday, it was actually today uh, for you and yesterday for Ukraine, it was International Volunteer Day. And uh, I know that since the since the Kherson was um, deliberated, so it, it's uh, a lot of when they let them go, a lot of volunteers, a lot of people to help. They went there to support their people, bringing uh, food and water and clothes and all the humanitarian aid products and uh, supporting them as well. And uh, bringing medicine, like everything to, to, to support me. And, and we go and our people and my friends, they go and do it to the uh, different parts of Ukraine and Kharkiv and Kherson and Kuwait and Zaporizhia and uh, before Kyiv region as well. Yeah. So I think this time, at this time we are united and uh, these small victories, they bring more hope. Okay, well, let's talk about the uh, hybrid, you know. Um, early on, back in, hmm, say, March, we were introduced to the term hybrid war. Uh, hybrid war is where you have multiple resources being applied in multiple ways, 
and uh, and it was Putin's. It was Putin's trick. Um, you know, he would he would um, attack this and then attack that, and then use um, hacking. You know, and um, he would use the press. He would lie. Um, these hybrid things, lots and lots of different things, and it was a hybrid war. They called it. You know? uh, so when you say it's a hybrid team. Uh, what do you mean by that? What's hybrid about the team? Um, I, I imagine you perform a number of different functions, a number of different specialties in a number of different places using a number of different strategies. But can you introduce us to uh, what the hybrid part of that is? Yeah, so definitely it unites uh, the number of countries, yeah, a number of cultural backgrounds. Uh, so from the uh, perspective of design thinking, it brings you a new a new strategy, yeah, and uh, of course um, different types of experience because uh, in this um, project, for example, me I'm not uh, I didn't deal with the uh, legal uh, projects before, uh, so the, we have people who are bringing different perspective on the uh, on its uh, activities, yeah. Um, as well as solutions, right? But uh, and also the, uh, the the idea that we have Ukrainians and international uh, experts uh, with a lot of years of experience in that already was like it's the hybrid uh, hybrid edge. Yeah, you mentioned uh, staying staying positive, staying focused. But it, it seems to me that the focus you're talking about is investigating and prosecuting war crimes. That's the focus. That's the yeah. the ultimate goal of the team. Um, and of course, there are you know there are issues about that. For example, um, my understanding is the criminal court in The Hague, the International Criminal Court, has not um, issued any indictments yet. And it's been 10, 11 months now. It's, it'll be a year pretty soon. Uh, and it hasn't done that. And so you wonder about the United Nations and the International Court of Criminal Justice, uh, what, what's holding them up. And at the same time, there have been, uh, there have been uh, you know, uh, war crimes trials in Ukraine by the Ukraine government. When the Ukraine government can catch a war criminal, uh, they have on occasion uh, tried that person and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, found punishment for that person. Um, there's also a, a concept in Western Europe called universal jurisdiction. Uh, Germany has done that with uh, Syrian war criminals uh, within their jurisdiction. You have to be within the jurisdiction. So, for example, if I'm a, a Russian general and I'm, I somehow wind up in Germany, uh, there's no question that if Germany knows, Germany will arrest me. Germany will try me. Germany will... You know, bring me to justice. So, in a number of Western European countries, that universal jurisdiction exists. I don't know if there have been trials of of um, war criminals in the Ukraine invasion. However, in those Western European countries, the only ones I know about, heard about, read about, are the ones in Ukraine itself. And so, tell me about your your goals, your mission in terms of bringing these people to justice. Because we all know, around the world we know, everyone in the world knows that the Russians are guilty of war crimes, of atrocities, violations of human rights, and genocide. We all know that. So what's holding it up, and what can you do about it? Yeah, well, uh, we are. what we are doing is uh, we are assisting Victims of war, and the crimes, uh, crimes uh, against humanity and genocide, and uh, uh, to seek the justice. And uh, we are we are relying here on different all the all the legal uh, available mechanisms supported. Uh, so as you mentioned, universal jurisdiction, yes, and uh, the courts, yes, I, I believe there will be. And we know from our partners that uh, some teams and some personalities uh, they work on that. Uh, they went to to the European courts. They submitted their uh, their applications also in, uh, 
European uh, Human Rights Group. Um, so I believe the the the, uh, the most important thing it will be the tribunal, which I know that um, the Ukrainian organization, uh, like the working group, is working really hard at the moment, meeting all, all around the globe and uh, meeting different countries, uh, preparing the background for the tribunal, preparing uh, that legal you know, mechanism to, to, to bring the remedies for the victims. So, and I believe, and from the signals we are getting uh, from the European Union and the United States, I, I, I believe, I, I truly believe that it will be done, uh, well, hopefully very soon. Uh, yes, we also work in, uh, as in, you know, as investigators, and, uh, so try to submit um, legal briefs, like sanction briefs, um, and to make you know, perpetrators and uh, you know uh, or other who are guilty in, the, uh, in particular plundering of Ukraine uh, and um, village um, of Ukrainian agricultural products to feel less comfortable. So, um, where do you find the best possibility for these war crime trials? Where are they going to be most effective? You know, what I'm, what I'm saying is that if you found some senior Russian general, for example, and you tried him, or Germany tried him under universal jurisdiction, or the uh, International Court of Criminal Justice decided to do something and indict him, um, it would be front page. You know, it would be international front page. And everybody in the world would know there is accountability. And on the one side, Ukrainian people could take confidence in that. And they could say, yes, you can... You can do that. You can do it. Um, the other side is that everyone would see the judicial result of that case and, and say, ah, you know, it's not just a rumor. Um, it's true. They do do war crimes. And we have to stop them. And it would, it would help, you know, consolidate the coalition. It would help get you aid. Um, and it would help get you weapons and so forth to combat what is proven in court as war crimes. So to me, that would be an important goal, okay, of anyone working on this matter, whether they are Ukrainian or whether they are coming into Ukraine to help. I'm sure there's a lot of people who do that uh, from outside Ukraine, or you. I mean, you, you could be in Cyprus, you could be in Paris, you could be in Berlin any number of places and do the same thing you do now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you agree with me it would have a big effect on the world if we could put a headline up there to say that some, um, you know, big name Russian general was found guilty of war crimes? Yeah, it's not It's not so easy to get them. Uh, though, um, I think we will have those um, generals you know, uh, when we will win the battlefield, uh, because they are not going after, <laughs> they are not going uh, from there uh, um, a lot. And uh, I think there is still hope, uh, or maybe uh, they negotiate uh, their future at the moment. We don't know, uh, which is assumed. They might negotiate their future at the moment, some of them. Um, Who, who's just, who's doing the negotiation? The general is doing the, the negotiation. The general, yeah, this, I, I, I think that the, the, some people, you know, close to the, uh, the Russian government, yeah, they understand now that uh, there is no way they are gonna win this war, and uh, they're gonna be in trouble. So I believe that some some people are leaving. Yeah, some people are from the close circles. There, they're leaving Russia. They changed the citizenship. 
And um, yeah, I know that we have a lot of consultations, like we hear, yeah, we hear from different sources that they have a lot of consultations with some advisors abroad. And um, yeah, and some of them are moving. Yeah. The, the most, uh, those who were, um, you know, connected with the work firms, uh, they're still there. And uh, I think they understand that it's not, uh, it's not so easy for them to just to go and uh, go anywhere because they have to think well, what's going to happen next to them. And um, obviously they, they can be reached by the, uh, by the police of the countries, by the Interpol, uh, many more institutions. So are they trying to negotiate their way out of accountability? Are they saying, look, you know, uh, I, I, I feel bad and um, I, I, I admit I was doing wrong and uh, uh, is there a deal we can make uh, so that you don't prosecute me uh, and give me a, a safe passage to a Western European country, for example? Um, and uh, I'll help you to the extent that I will I will give you information. Um, I will tell you who else was involved, you know, sort of like, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm making a guilty plea, but um, a, a, an agreement for a very low sentence, that sort of thing. Um, is that is that what happens with these guys? Because that's good. If you can if you can do that, if you can get them to do that. Well, I don't know exactly yet because I'm not. Uh, I don't have the power to to state that this is what happened. Uh, but I, it's just an assumption, and uh, that's an assumption. But we can hear it from many sources that uh, those people are, are now trying to find the ways. Yeah, I would. I would think it's good. I I don't have any information either. But um, yeah. or let me put it this way: I have less information than you would. <laughs> but but I. I Not too many seems... people. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the other thing is this: um, no, so we we know what crimes have been committed, and we we know about Buka. You know, we 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 all heard about Buka, and we've seen you know photographs that are undeniable. Although Mr. Putin has. And some of his generals have denied what is obvious in the photograph, you know. Um, but but the word gets out. The word gets out to those young troops that have been maybe not well educated and and pulled in from rural areas in Russia, and and put on the front lines without uh, equipment or even food. And certainly they aren't getting paid. Russia can't afford to pay them. Um, so the army, you know, gets weaker. But my question to you is, a few months ago, it was clear that Putin's army, including the Chechnyans, you know, the Wagner group, you remember about the Wagner group, um, were, were doing war crimes left and right and center all over the place. Uh, they were liberated to do war crimes. That's the way uh, the Russian army worked. But now I expect that a lot of those same people from, you know, the Privates onto the generals, they know about this risk. They know that if they do war crimes, there may well be accountability. And that people are investigating them. And they may be at the wrong end of a trial someday soon, one way or the other. <clears throat> My question to you, Elisa, does this mean that there are fewer war crimes going on now? Is it decreasing? Is it increasing? Is it staying the same? What's the dynamic on, you know, on the number of war crimes, the, the atrocity of the war crimes that you hear about now? Uh, well, I don't think that it's uh, any, any less than previously, because um, what you are saying that they are younger guy, guys who, and they brought them, they mobilized them. Uh, but we also have those Wagner groups and uh, those like pure criminals. So what would you expect from those people? <laughs> um, I don't expect much. Um, just to yeah, just to commit the same same criminal uh, actions um, towards. But I don't think that the the um, only the only occupied territories, uh, especially because they were coming uh, like her son. It's uh, uh, they were they were torturing the people. They were trying to get information. They were trying to uh, 
trying to make them talk, make them, uh, you know, do many things. And um, uh, in, in, in general sense, I don't think that there, there are less crimes uh, happening. Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we just don't, we just don't know about all of them. Like, yeah, it's, uh, it's not, it's not the main focus now here, yeah? um, but still, um, but still, uh, it was from the first days of work. Even uh, because I have because I have friends um, serving, and I have also my friends um, volunteering a lot. So I heard about the, the crimes from the first days, even even though it, it was not on news. So the the, the first uh, terrible pictures uh, like the situation I started to get uh, very early, like straight away. And as soon as they entered the Kiev region. So yeah, I don't think that things things have changed. Mm. changed. I'm profoundly sorry to hear you say that. But uh, let me ask, you know, this is going on for 10, 11 months now. And, um, you know, Ukraine has taken some terrible blows. I mean, a lot of people have been killed. A lot of people are being killed. Either you know by by the the weapons of the war, but also by by the cold and the lack of medical facilities. You know, life has been interrupted, and seniors die without you know the kind of life support that seniors need to have to stay alive, especially in the winter. And um, and then you talk to somebody like you, Lisa. You talk to a um, Ukrainian soldier. You talk to an Ukrainian. Ukrainian um, public official or diplomat, and and what you get is, we are strong. Glory to Ukraine. We are not weakening in any way. Uh, we have resolve. We have, we are unified in our in our desire to get them out of our country. And yet, you don't see anger. <laughs> I don't see anger in you. I don't see anger in the people from Ukraine who speak about this. I'll tell you now, if it was me, I would be furious. I would be so angry I could hardly control myself. Why don't you demonstrate anger? Are you not angry? Well, I think that there was um, one of the stages uh, some time ago. But uh, I think I, pr I prefer the constructive anger, you know? when you are trying to not be angry, just, you know, to be furious, just to be negative, but when you're trying to convert it into action, and uh, that brings me more, uh, more powerful and confidence and satisfaction. Um, because when you're more effective and you know that uh, you're doing the right thing, and uh, this is your place, you know, to feel that this is the place you're you're making change, and uh, yeah, it works better. For me. And you remember, I already mentioned we have to focus. Uh, we have to balance this. We have to balance the anger and pain, and uh, all this terrible experience we are getting every day. Uh, every time we look at the news, or you know, receiving a call from home. Uh, so we have to balance that with a hope and optimism and uh, a focus on the positive. And yeah, and um, small positive things as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Elisa. Elisa Golish, Golishapova. I'm sure, I got that right. <laughs> thank you for joining us today and answering my questions and um, telling us how your work is and how Project Expedite Justice serves serves this mission um, and how things are going at a very fundamental level uh, with you and others in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Uh, long Thank live you, Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Hello, Queen. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.